a man hungering and thirsting after righteousness, as Wesley was now, was not left long without more light. The good work which the Holy Ghost had begun within him was carried on rapidly after he landed in England until the sun rose on his mind and the shadows passed away. Partly by conference with Peter Bowler, a Moravian, and other Moravians in London, partly by study of the Scriptures, partly by special prayer for living, saving, justifying faith as the gift of God, he was brought to a clear view of the Gospel and found out the meaning of joy and peace in simply believing. Let me add, as an act of justice to one of whom the world was not worthy, that at this period he was, by his own confession, much helped by Martin Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. This year, 1738, was beyond doubt the turning point in Wesley's spiritual history and gave a direction to all his subsequent life. It was in the spring of this year that he began a religious society at the Moravian Chapel in Fetter Lane, London, which was the rough type and pattern of all Methodist societies formed afterwards. The rules of this little society are extant still, and with some additions, modifications and improvements, contain the inward organisation of Methodism in the present day. It was at this period also that he began preaching the new truths that he had learned in many of the pulpits in London, and soon found, like Whitfield, that the proclamation of salvation by grace and justification by faith was seldom allowed a second time. It was in the winter of this year, after returning from a visit to the Moravian settlement in Germany, that he began aggressive measures on home heathenism, and in the neighbourhood of Bristol, followed Whitfield's example by preaching in the open air, in rooms or wherever men could be brought together. We have now reached a point at which John Wesley's history, like that of his great contemporary Whitfield, becomes one undeviating uniform narrative up to the time of his death. It would be useless to dwell on one year more than another. He was always occupied in one and the same business, always going up and down the land preaching, and always conducting evangelistic measures of some kind and description. For 53 years, from 1738 to 1791, he held on his course, always busy, and always busy about one thing, attacking sin and ignorance everywhere, preaching repentance toward God, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ everywhere, awakening open sinners, leading on inquirers, building up saints, never wearied, never swerving from the path he had marked out, and never doubting of success. Those only who read the journals he kept for 50 years can have any idea of the immense amount of work that he got through. Never perhaps did any man have so many irons in the fire at one time, and yet succeed in keeping so many hot. Like Whitfield, he justly regarded preaching as God's chosen instrument for doing good to souls, and hence, wherever he went, his first step was to preach. Like him, too, he was ready to preach anywhere, or at any hour, early in the morning or late at night, in church, in chapel, or in room, in streets, in fields, or on commons and greens. Like him, too, he was always preaching more or less the same great truths, sin, Christ and holiness, ruin, redemption and regeneration, the blood of Christ and the work of the Spirit, faith, repentance and conversion from one end of the year to the other. Wesley, however, was very unlike Whitfield in one important respect. He did not forget to organise as well as to preach. He was not content with reaping the fields which he found ripe for the harvest. He took care to bind up his sheaves and gather them into the barn. 
he was as far superior to Whitfield as an administrator and man of method as he was inferior to him as a mere preacher. And here Ryle adds uh, a note which says, A writer in the North British Review has well and forcibly described the difference between the two great English evangelists of the last century. Whitfield was soul and Wesley was system. Whitfield was the summer cloud which burst at morning or noon, a fragrant exhalation over an ample track, and took the rest of the day to gather again. Wesley was the polished conduit in the midst of the garden, through which the living water glided in the pearly brightness and perennial music, the same vivid stream from day to day. All force and impetus, Whitfield was the powder blast in the quarry, and by one explosive sermon would shake a district and detach materials for other men's long work. Deft, neat and painstaking, Wesley loved to split and trim each fragment into uniform plinths and polished stones. Whitfield was the bargeman or the wagoner who brought the timber of the house, and Wesley was the architect who set it up. Whitfield had no patience for ecclesiastical polity, no aptitude for pastoral details. Wesley, with a leader-like propensity for building, was always constructing societies, and with a king-like craft of ruling, was most at home when presiding over a class or a conference. It was their infelicity that they did not always work together. It was the happiness of the age and the furtherance of the gospel that they lived alongside of one another. Then Ryle resumes his narrative of Wesley's life as follows. Shut out from the Church of England by the folly of its rulers, he laid the foundation of a new denomination with matchless skill, and with a rare discernment of the wants of human nature. To unite his people as one body, to give every one something to do, to make each one consider his neighbour and seek his edification, to call forth latent talent and utilise it in some direction, to keep all at it and always at it, to adopt his quaint saying, these were his aims and objects. The machinery he called into existence was admirably well adapted to carry out his purposes. His preachers, lay preachers, class leaders, band leaders, circuits, classes, bands, love feasts and watch nights made up a spiritual engine which stands to this day and in its own way can hardly be improved. If one thing more than another has given permanence and solidity to Methodism, it was its founder's masterly talent for organisation. It is needless to tell a Christian reader that Wesley had constantly to fight with opposition. The prince of this world will never allow his captives to be rescued from him without a struggle. Sometimes he was in danger of losing his life by the assaults of violent, ignorant and semi-heathen mobs as at Wednesbury, Walsall, Colne, Shoreham and Devizes. Sometimes he was denounced by bishops as an enthusiast, a fanatic and a sower of dissent. Often, far too often, he was preached against and held up to scorn by the parochial clergy as a heretic, a mischief maker and a meddling troubler of Israel. But none of these things moved the good man. Calmly, resolutely, and undauntedly he held on his course, and in scores of cases lived down all opposition. His letters in reply to the attacks made upon him are always dignified and sensible, and do equal honour to his heart and head. I have now probably told the reader enough to give him a general idea of John Wesley's life and history. I dare not go further. Indeed, the last fifty years of his life were so entirely of one complexion that I know not where I should stop if I went further. When I have said that they were years of constant travelling, preaching, organising, 
conferring, writing, arguing, reasoning, counselling and warring against sin, the world and the devil. I have just said all that I dare enter upon.' 